A very good evening, one and all. Uh, am I clearly audible? Sir, audible, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, is my screen visible to you all? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, let's start. So, in this, the agenda for today is to uh, cover um, probability basics, um, random variables, and probability distributions. Uh, in the first half and the second half deals with the Python um, essentials again uh, by Dr. Bala Prakash. So this is the agenda for today. So in this section, particularly, we will be discussing about the probability concepts. Um, though these are very basic concepts that some of you may are aware of them already, this forms the basis for many of the concepts that we're going to discuss in the coming sessions. So that is why this session is very much important uh, to have a continuity and to understand the um, upcoming concepts better. So in this session, we deal with random variables, both uh, continuous and discrete random variables, and then we'll deal with the notions of joint, marginal, and conditional probability distributions. And we'll also discuss the probability properties of random variables, expectation, variance, covariance of the random variables, and we'll also discuss the probability distributions over discrete and continuous random variables with examples. So this is the agenda for this particular session. So let's start. Where do you, I mean, what is the probability? What is the probability? As we all know, probability is the chance of an outcome to be an experiment, right? So we conduct some experiment. We also call it as an event, right? So what is the probability that a particular value occurs, right? For example, if the event is tossing a fair coin, then outcome can be head or tail. So we interested in predicting what is the probability that the outcome is head or what is the probability that the outcome is tail. So the chance of an outcome in an experiment. So what is the chance that this coin will take head or what is the chance that the coin will take tail, right? So if you observe, the probability is dealing with predicting the likelihood of the future events. So what would be the probability that it will be head? Or what is the probability that it would be uh, tail? Right. So it is dealing with the uh, probability or the likelihood of the future events. Right. Whereas the statistics involves the analysis of the past events. Analysis of the frequency of the past events. So you, can, you may perform analysis on the um, statics, statistics of the uh, COVID cases during the last three months. So are they varying? Right, so statistics involves the analysis of the frequency of the past events. So let us see through the examples, both probability uh, and statistics. So consider there is a drawer containing 100 socks, 100 socks and 30 of these socks are red, 20 of them is blue and 50 of them is black, 50 of them are black. So we can use the probability concepts to answer questions like what is the probability that we drop two, block, uh, two blue socks or two red socks from the drawing? Or what is the probability that we pull out three socks or having a matching pair? Or what is the probability that we draw five socks and all of them are black? So these are the kind of questions that we ask. Right, so we are interested in predicting the likelihood of the future events. Right, so given the distribution of, given the distribution of these different socks, socks, isn't it? So we know that how they are distributed and we are interested in predicting, I mean, are we interested in finding out the likelihood of certain quantity or certain event in the case of probability, right? Whereas in case of statistics, we deal it differently. We have a no knowledge about the type of socks in the drawing, then we enter into the realm of statistics. So statistics help us to infer the properties about the population on the basis of the random sample that we have picked up. So the questions could be something like, 
Suppose a random sample of 10 socks from the drawer produced one blue, four red and five black socks. So see here, observe here, we do not know what is the actual distribution of this blue, red and black socks. We have just picked up 10 socks from the drawer and this sample has produced one blue, four red and five blocks. So what is the total population of black, blue or red socks in the drawer? Right. So similarly, if we randomly sample 10 socks and write down the number of black socks in it, out of this 10, how many are black? And then we return the socks to the drawer. And this process is repeated for five times. Right. The mean number of socks for each of this trial is seven. So this is what we have got. Now the question, kind of question that we're going to answer using the statistics is, what is the true number of block socks in the drawer? So this is the kind of question the statistics answer. So to summarize, in probability, we are given a model, the distribution of these different variables, and ask what kind of data we are likely to see. Whereas in case of statistics, we are given data, we are not given the model. And we asked about what kind of the model is likely to have generated it. Did you get the difference? In the probability, we are given the model and we are asking like, what kind of data this model will generate. Whereas in case of statistics, we are given a data and we are asking that what kind of model would have generated this data? Would have generated this data. Right? So there is a difference. So examples, if you take another example, the first one is the example for the probability, and the second one is the example for this statistics. Probability, you have a fair coin and you will toss it 100 times. So what is the probability of 60 or more heads? So we can get only a single answer because of the standard computational strategy here. So whereas in case of statistics, you have a coin of unknown provenance. You don't know whether it is a biased or not. To investigate whether it is a fair, you toss it 100 times and count the number of heads. So let's say your count is 60 heads. So your job as a statistician is to draw a conclusion from this data whether it is a fair coin or not. Right. So what is a random variable? If you observe the previous examples also, the probability is often associated with at least one event. So am I not audible? Somebody is saying that I'm not audible. Am I not audible? Okay, okay, you can hear me now, right. <clears throat> so the probability is often associated with at least one event. Even could be a tossing a coin, even could be a rolling a dice, or even could be pulling a, a color ball or pulling a color socks out of the bag, right? So in all these examples, the outcome of event is random. You do not know what would be the outcome. If you take uh, a coin tossing experiment, you do not know whether it is style or head. You don't know. If you pick a color ball, you don't know whether it is a red, green or blue, right? So in these examples, the outcome of the event is random. So the variable that represents the outcome of these events, we call it as a random variable. Right, we represent the outcome with one variable, right? So we call that as a random variable. So random variable is a variable that assumes numerical values associated with the random outcome of the experiments. So where one numerical value assigned to each sample point. So informally, random variable X denotes the possible outcome of an event. So what is the possible outcome of an event? Okay, so this outcome can be discrete or continuous. So what is the difference? What is the discrete random variable and what is a continuous random variable? So let's talk about discrete random variable. So if I pick any two consecutive outcomes, I can't get any outcome that is in between. Then I call it as a discrete random variable. Right. For example, if I, if I throw a dice, right, 
if a troyad dies, the outcome could be either one or two or three or four or five or six. It can all be 1.5, isn't it? So if you take any two consecutive outcomes, one or two, you cannot take another value in between like 1.5. Okay, so the list of outcomes in this case is countable, limited, finite, right? So like these are the some of the examples. Suppose if you make an experiment and experiment is making 100 sales calls and the random variable representing the number of sales. So if you make 100 sales calls, either you may get one sale or zero sale or two sale or 100 sales also possible. So the possible values for this number of sales random variable is zero to 100. It cannot be 1.5 sale or 2.3 sale, something like that. So the possible values are either zero or one or two or so on, 100. Similarly, if you conduct an experiment of inspecting 70 radios and the random variable representing the number of defective. Right, number of defective radios. The possible values for this are 0 or 1 or 2 or so on, 70. It cannot be 2.35. Right. Similarly, if you answer 33 questions, how many number of questions are correct? Random variable is representing that. So possible values are 0 to 33. Right. If we take the continuous random variable, random variable can assume any value corresponding to any of the points containing in one or more intervals. Like for example, if you take weight of 100 people and the random variable representing the average weight, right? the possible value could be anything, right? You cannot restrict it to some countable number of values. You cannot say that it should be 45 or 50 or 55 or 60, something like that. It can take any value. It can be 45.1, it can be 78.34, it can take any value, infinite number of possibilities here. So the other examples are measure time taken or the amount that you spent on food or measure time between the arrivals. So these are all the examples of the continuous random variables. So if you look at the probability, we are often interested in knowing the probability that a random variable taking a certain value. So the random variable associated with your experiment, which is capturing uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, capturing the event, right, that you are interested in. So now we are saying that we are interested in knowing the probability that this random variable taking a certain value. Like, for example, if you throw a dice, right, what is the probability that outcome is three? Or if you take the average of 100 people, what is the probability that weight is average weight is less than or equal to 70? Okay, right. so these are the things in general we are interested in. So there are different types of probability. Probability can be either marginal probability or joint probability or conditional probability. So let's have a look at them one by one. What is marginal probability? If A is an event, then the marginal event is the probability that event occurring. What is the probability that A occurs, irrespective of the other things? Like for example, assume that we have a pack of cards, right? So, uh, so what is the probability that if you randomly pick up one card, what is the probability that it is red color? What is the probability that it is red color? How many cards will we have? In the deck of cards, we have 52 number of cards. And out of them, 26 are red, 26 are black. So what is the probability that it is red? 26 by 52, which is 0 0.5. So if you observe here, irrespective of this card is irrespective of the value that the card is taking. Okay, so you are interested in probability of red marginal probability. You're not interested in what value that the card is taking or what symbol that the card is taking. You're not interested in that, irrespective of that. So the red card means it may take hearts, it may take diamonds, it can take value one or two or three or four or five, any value, right? Irrespective of all those values, you're just interested in probability that it is red, right? And joint probability is the probability of intersection of two or more events. 
Suppose if A and B are two events, then the joint probability of two events is probability of A intersection B. Or if X and Y are two random variables, what is the probability that X takes certain value X, Y takes certain value Y? Right. So this is how we express the joint probability. For example, if you pick a card, what is the probability that it is red and takes a value 4? So there are two events here. It should be red and it should be 4. Okay. So how many red and 4 cards are there? Two cards are there out of 52. One is with hearts, one is with diamonds. So what is the probability that so what is the probability that it is red and 4 is 2 by 52 that is 1 by 26. We call this as a joint probability. Okay, so intersection of two or more events. Another one is the conditional probability. What is the probability that probability that some event occurs given that other event is already happened. So if A and B are two events, then the conditional probability is probability of A given that B has already occurred. Right. For example, what is the probability that card is 4 given that we have drawn a red card? Okay, so how many red cards are there? Out of 52, just now I mentioned that the number of red cards is 20, uh, number of red cards is 26. So out of this 26, how many fours? Two fours. So 2 by 26, which is 1 by 13. Okay, so let's see another example to understand it better. Discrete case example. So in this experiment, we toss a coin, which is our first event, and we throw a dice, which is our second event. So there are two events happening simultaneously. So we look at the probability of each event. For instance, the probability to get heads is 1 by 2, and probability to roll a dice is 1 by 6. Right, a, a roll uh, a 1 is 1 by 6. Dice taking a value 1 is 1 by 6. So if you see this, the probability distribution table heads, the probability of heads and throwing a dice equivalent to 1. Right, so the two events, probability that coin taking heads and probability that dice taking value 1. Right. So the intersection of two events, which is 1 by 12. Right. So if I ask a question, what is the probability that coin takes a value heads? What would you do? So irrespective of the value that the dice is taking, you are interested in probability of heads. So what would you do? You just take the sum of individual joint probabilities in this row. So 1 by 12 plus 1 by 12 plus 1 by 12 plus 1 by 12, so 1 by 12. So this is equivalent to 1 by 2. We call this as a marginal probability. So irrespective of the values that the other event is taking, you are just interested in probability of heads. So this is marginal probability, right? So what is the probability of heads? Which is probability of heads comma dice equivalent to 1 plus probability of heads comma dice equivalent to 2, so on. Probability of heads comma dice equivalent to 6, so which is equivalent to 1 by 2. So to define it more formally, what is the probability that x taking a certain value x is sum of y probability of x equivalent to x comma y equivalent to y. So irrespective of the value that the y is taking, value y is the random variable representing the second event, representing the outcome of the second event. So irrespective of the value that y is taking, you're just interested in probability of x. Therefore, you're just summing up all the possible values, probability or all the possible values of y. So this we call it as a sum rule. Right. And the conditional probability, conditional probability refers to the probability of an event given that another event has already occurred. Okay, so in this case, it is important to distinguish between the dependent events and the independent events because the intuition is a bit different in both the cases. Like if you take the example of the independent events, the dice and the coin experiment, both of them are independent of one another, isn't it? So throwing a dice and uh, flipping a coin, both of them independent of one another. Example of dependent events are two cards from a deck. 
without replacing the first card back to the card back to the deck right so this is a dependent event because the outcome of the second event depends on what card that you have sorry picked picked in the um uh, first experiment first event so the outcome of the second event depends on the first event so they are dependent events so the notation here is probability of y given x it is the probability that y equal to y given that x equal to x so mathematically there is a convenient relationship between the conditional probability and the joint probability what is the joint probability probability that x equal to x and y equal to y so the relation is probability of y given x is equal to probability of y comma x divided by probability of x so just for my convenience i am just treating it as probability of y given x because uh, it, i mean i hope you will understand that it is not necessary to read every time it as y equal to y or x equal to x okay right. so there is more intuitive way of looking at this so uh, like for example so if i bring out this x this side this denominator this side okay so joint probability probability of x equal to x and y equal to y is equal to probability of x times probability of y given x right it is more intuitive right here the joint probability is equal to probability of x times probability that y given x so you have to first compute what is the probability of x then what is the probability of y given x so to calculate the probability that both event occurs we have to take the probability of the first event occurs and multiply it with the probability of the second event given the first event okay and you can say that probability of x comma y is equal to probability of y comma x can i say that because anyhow this is a joint probability the intersection of the two events x and y right so probability of x comma y is equal to probability of y comma x so if i expand this both of them probability of x times probability of y given x this uh, on lhs and rhs probability of y times probability of x given y right so from this i can say that probability of x given y is equal and if i bring this this side which is equal to probability of y given x times probability of x divided by probability of y so what is this this we call it as the bayesian theorem so which is also very much important for our upcoming sessions okay so there is a relation so try to understand between uh, uh, try to understand that relation between the different probabilities so if you take the independent events if two events x and y are independent we say that probability of x given y is equal to probability of x because x is independent of y so whether whatever the value that y is taking doesn't matter probability of x given y is equal to probability of x and this is the example demonstrating that i'm just skipping that you can go through it later it is very easy and dependent events the example is drawing two cards from a deck of cards without replacing the first card okay so we draw two cards without replacement the first step is to use what we learn and write the problem using the mathematical notation okay so let's say that x is the variable corresponding to the first row and y is the variable corresponding to the second row right so to mathematically represent this problem what is the probability that y equal to 6 given x equal to 6 so what is the probability that the second card that you picked up is taking a value 6 given that the first card that you have picked up is also 6 so can anyone tell this what is the probability that y equal to 6 given x equal to 6 anyone how many 6 do we have out of 52 cards 3 by 
Okay, this is 3 by 51. Very good. Right. So in total, we have six cards. Sorry, four uh, cards uh, with value six. Right. So if we pick up one card with six already in the first event, how many cards we are left with? The value six, three cards. And how many total number of cards? 51. So the probability is 3 by 51. Right. So, so we have completed the basic probability concepts and let's have a look at the probability distributions. So what is a probability distribution? Any query? All right. So what is the probability distribution? Shama, Shama, do you have any query? All right. The probability distribution is a list of all the possible outcomes of a random variable along with their corresponding probability values. How the different probabilities are distributed. Right. So for example, if you take the outcome of dice roll. Outcome of the dice roll. The dice can take any one of the outcome output can be any one of the six values. It can be one or two or three or four or five or six. And if it is a fair dice, the probability is equal, equiprobable, every outcome is equiprobable. So therefore it is one by six, one by six and so on. So if you see, this is how the probabilities are distributed uniformly. So this is an example of discrete univariate probability distribution with finite support. Why is it discrete? Because it is taking a countable number of values and you cannot take any uh, intermediate value between the two consecutive values. That is why it is discrete. And why is it univariate? Because you are only talking about one event here. You are not talking about multiple events. You are just talking about event of outcome of the dice. So it's one event. You are not talking about the multiple events. That is why it is univariate. Why is it finite support? Because the output is finite. The value that the uh, the value that this random variable is taking is finite finite number of values right so there are some rules for this but this probability satisfies for discrete random variable p of x denotes the probability that x equivalent to x so like for example if i say probability of 6 it means probability that random variable x is taking a value 6 Okay, so here P of X, we call it as a probability mass function and all of you know probability value must be in between 0 and 1. So it can be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to less than or equal to 1. It cannot be greater than 1 or less than 0 and some of all the individual probabilities must be equivalent to 1. Like for example, if you sum up all these individual probabilities, it sums up to 1. Right. And this is another example of discrete probability distribution. Suppose if I toss two coins and the random variable representing the uh, number of tails, counting the number of tails. So what are the possible outcomes for this? If you toss two coins, either both of them can be uh, tails or both of them can be heads or one tail, one head. The first one can be head and second one can be tail or the second one is uh, head and first one can be tail. So the possible outcomes are this. So if you count the number of tails in this case, because both are heads, it is zero. And in this both the cases, it is one. And in this case, it is two because both of them are tails. Right. So what is the probability of zero tails? One out of four cases we have zero tails. So the probability is one by four, which is 0 0.25. And two out of the four cases, we have one tail, right? So the probability is two by four, this is therefore it is 0 0.5. Similarly, for the heads, it is one, uh, for the, um, sorry, for both the tails, the possibility is one by four, which is 0 0.25. So if you represent this visually in different ways, if you list out here, by using listing, you, this is how you can represent 
zero with 0.25 probability, one with 0.5 probability, two with 0.25 probability. If you represent it in a table, this is how you can represent zero with 0.25 probability, one with 0.5. If you represent with a graph, this is how it is looking like, right? And if you represent this with a formula, this is how you can represent. Okay, so what is the probability of one? which is equivalent to 2 factorial by 1 factorial times 1 factorial 0 0.5 power 1 times 1 minus p power. So this is 2 times 0 0.25 which is equivalent to 0 0.5 so which is this. So this is a, a example of the binomial distribution. So this is about the discrete probability distribution and we're going to see different discrete probability distributions. Right. Um, now let's talk about the continuous probability distribution. Right. So for a continuous random variable, a probability of x taking a certain value x is meaningless and most of the time it may be zero. So suppose if I say that what is the probability that weight is equivalent to 75.234567. Is it meaningful? No, right? So meaningless and it may be zero. The average weight cannot be like that exact value. So instead, in the continuous case, we use f of x to denote the probability density, or the probability mass, probability density, and it is often expressed in terms of the integral between two points. What is the probability that uh, x is taking a value between a and b? Or what is the probability that x is less than or equal to 70? Or what is the probability that x is greater than or equal to 80? Right. So this is how we express in case of the continuous case. So like the graph, you can see that this is the probability density distribution of the uh, values. So we are interested in knowing what is the probability that this x is taking a value between a and b, which means we are interested in this area under this curve, this particular area under this curve. And the total area under this curve is equivalent to one because the whole probability together or probabilities together should be equivalent to one. Right. So let's see through the example, you will understand it better. So like for example, if I take a metal cylinder production, metal cylinder production. So there is a company which is producing the metal cylinders. And the random variable X is representing the diameter of the randomly chosen cylinder manufactured by the company. And because it is a random variable, it can take any value between 49.5 to 50.5. It means what? The metal cylinders produced by this company diameter can be any value between 49.5 to 50.5. So therefore, it is a continuous random variable because it can take any value between 49.5 to 50.5. Therefore, it is a continuous random variable. Right, uh, we'll see some more examples. I mean, same example, we'll work it out. But before that, these are the rules. Like in case of uh, discrete case, we said that probability must be greater than or equal to zero, right? So here also f of x must be greater than or equal to zero and integral over x f of x dx is equivalent to one. So this is equivalent to that sum over x, p of x must be equivalent to one. Because it is a continuous variable, we're representing with the integral. So suppose that the diameter of the metal cylinder has the following probability distribution. So this is how you represent the diameter of the metal cylinder using the probability density function. So if the random variable is in between 49.5 to x, uh, sorry, 49.5 to 50.5, and this is how it is distributed, right? If it is uh, elsewhere, it is zero. It means there is no cylinder with a diameter less than 49.5 and greater than 50.5. That's what it means. And this is the distribution of the cylinders within the range of 49.5 to 50.5. So let's sub substitute one of the value and see what is happening. Okay, this must be 
50 i guess x minus 50 i suppose according to this okay let us try to substitute 1.5 minus 6 let's say x equivalent to 50 6 times x minus 50 minus 50.2 whole square as 1.5 minus 6 times uh, this supposed to be 50 i guess because the maximum value occurs at 50 right so let's substitute 50 then 50 minus 50 is 0 so the whole thing would be 0 and 1.5 so this is the distribution at here right so let's see whether this is a valid probability density function or not yeah this is 50 you can see here right 1.5 minus x minus 2 times oh this is a different okay so this is two times all right so all right no problem this must be clear okay no 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 i'm sorry i'm really sorry so there is little confusion so this is after the integral we have got so this is six only but this is 50. right so if you what if it uh, if it is a valid probability distribution function then it must satisfy these two conditions right integral over f of x dx must be equal into one so right so x can be any value between 49.5 to 50.5 so integral over f of x and dx is equal into this so if you know the integrals this is equal into this and it is any value between 49.5 to 50.5 right so to get this what would you do let's say if this is f of x so this is f of x and so to get the value what would you do f of 50.5 minus f of 49.5 so substitute 50.5 in place of x so you would get this substitute 49.5 in place of this you would get this so this value is 75.5 and this value is 74.5 and the resultant is 1. So because the integral over f of x dx is equal to 1, this is a valid probability density function. Right. Suppose if you are interested in knowing the, what is the uh, probability that metal cylinder is taking a uh, certain value between 49.8 and 50.1. It means you are interested in this area of this curve, this area under this curve. So how do we measure that? The same procedure, we take 49.8 and 50.1 as the interval. So if we do so with the same procedure, you will get 0 0.432 as this area. So this is the probability that the metal cylinder takes a value between 49.8 and 50.1. 49 so what is a cumulative distribution function? Cumulative distribution function is what is the probability that x is less than or equal to x? Cumulative. Okay. So what are the what is the probability of uh, uh, coronavirus cases so far? If today. So what would you do? You will take the total population in the denominator and you will sum up all the COVID cases that we have got so far since the beginning of the day, cumulative, right, right, divided by total population, right, cumulative. So you will take probability that x less than or equal to x. So to do that, f of x, small f of x can be represented as the derivative of f of x, dx, right. So if I say, what is the probability that A less than or equal to X less than or equal to B? Then can I write it as probability of X less than or equal to B minus probability of X less than or equal to A, right? Because we are not interested in what is less than A. This is less than A. This is A and this is B, okay? Then this cumulative distribution is giving this probability of x less than or equal to b means this whole area. And probability of a less than uh, x less than or equal to a means this area. So we are not interested in this area. We are just interested in this area. So, so 
subtract this area from this area. So probability of x less than or equal to b minus probability of x less than a. Right. So for our example, this is how you can compute the cumulative distribution function. Probability of x less than or equal to x is because you're not fixing x. So x is here. So you know the lower bound, which is 49.5. With that, you solve it. You get the probability. So the cumulative distribution function as this. So once you get the cumulative distribution function, computing the interval is so easy, right? So this is the cumulative distribution function. And if you want to know the probability that x taking a interval of 49.7 to 50.0, then you just substitute from 50 in this function, probability of 50 minus probability, sorry, f of 49.7, you would get 0 0.396. So to visualize this graphically, this is how you can represent. So this is a cumulative distribution function. It is always increasing. This is a cumulative distribution function, right? So this is, if you want to know the interval 49.7 to 50.7, you have to know the probability at 50 and probability at 49.7 and subtract it. So you're interested in this interval, right? So any queries so far? Are you following me? Following me? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, so any queries so far? Okay, then we'll proceed. Okay, thank you. Now we have seen what is continuous probability distribution and what is marginal probability distribution in the case of continuous random variable? Okay, so what is marginal probability distribution? Let's talk about discrete. In case of discrete case, the probability of one random variable, regardless of the value that the other random variable is taking, right? For example, probability of heads, irrespective of the value that the dice is taking, that is the marginal probability distribution. And we have seen that how to compute the marginal probability distribution. If you're interested in probability of x, just take sum of y probability of x comma y. And probability of y sum over x probability of x comma y. Right. For continuous case, if you see, so this is how you can compute. If you have two random variables, continuous random variables, x and y, then Integral over x, integral over y, probability of x comma y dx dy is equal into 1, which is the whole probability must be equal into 1. So if you are just interested in probability of x, which is equal into integral over x, so just compare this. This is sum of x and this is the integral over x because it's a continuous case. Probability of x comma y equal into y. Similarly, probability of y equal into integral over x, probability of x comma y dx. So if you want to visualize this, what it is and uh, how it looks like, if you see the distribution of the two values, let's say this is x and this is y, and this is how they are distributed, right? So this is how the values are distributed in a two-dimensional space. Suppose if you ask what is the probability of x irrespective of the values that the y is taking, how they are distributed? how the x values are distributed irrespective of the y values, right? It means what you're not interested in this dimension. You just want to project all these values and you're just interested in the value of x. And this is how the values of the x are distributed. This is how the values of x are distributed irrespective of the values that the y is taking. Similarly, if you're just interested in probability of y irrespective of the values that x is taking, Right, so you can just project them in the y dimension, uh, in this dimension, so where you are not accounting for the value of x. So this is how the values of uh, y are distributed irrespective of the value that x is taking. Right, so if you see the whole distribution, maybe you can imagine it like a hill in the three dimension, uh, two dimensional, sorry, three dimensional space. Right. Excuse right. me, sir. Yes, yes, yes. 
Uh, sir, can we say that these are just like partial derivatives only it considers probability distribution? Where is the derivative? Indicate. No, I am asking like the way the partial derivatives work is equal to, uh, is similar to this how the marginal probability distribution is working. Um, partial derivatives gives you the slope, right? Yes, sir. But here you are not interested in slope of the function. You are just interested in uh, the uh, cumulative distribution according, I mean, irrespective of the values that one of uh, one of the variable is taking. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank so, you, sir. G. Yeah. Uh, have you got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've got it now. Okay. Sir. Yes. Sir, any example of marginal probability? Well, this is how you can visualize. Um, example of the marginal probability is um, uh, we have seen many examples. No, in the case of discrete, like for example, um, suppose if you have a two events. Um, uh, two events. Um, like, uh, for example, um, what is the value that uh, the uh, fair coin is taking? And another event representing the outcome of the dice. Okay, so there are two events. Let's say X and Y. X is the outcome of the coin toss, and Y is the outcome of the dice. Then both are the independent, no? They are independent in this case but uh, they can be uh, dependent also so the dependent is a bit uh, different the dependent case is a bit different uh, from the independent case so in any of this so because if you see the only thing that would change is let me find some space yeah here it is so if you see this let them let me take that okay so if I take, what is this? Suppose if this is heads and this is one, why, what is the probability that y equal into one? And what is the probability that x equal into head and y equal into one? So what is this? This is a joint probability, right? Probability of x equal into head and y equal into one, right? Because they are independent events, this probability may change. The entry may change, like this is equivalent to probability of x equivalent to head times probability of y equivalent to 1. Okay, so if they are independent, this formula will change. If they are, I mean, sorry, if they are dependent, if they are dependent, what would be the formula? What is the probability of x times probability of y given x? In the case of uh, independency probability of y given x is equivalent to probability of y that is why this is equivalent to probability of x times probability of y isn't it sir so this joint probability will change but the marginal probability if you see irrespective of the value suppose if you are interested in probability of x so what it is irrespective of the value that y is taking it is just sum of y probability of x comma y yes but only thing that is changing is what between the dependency and independency, the joint probability. Marginal probability is same, irrespective of the value that the other one is taking. Have you got it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Let me answer. Is it like time series data? Which one, ma'am? Brinda, ma'am? The continuous case. Not necessarily time series data. Yes, sir. And not necessarily time series data always. It can be some predicting prediction data also, like predicting the continuous value, like for example, predicting the price of the house. So the value of the price is a continuous, right? All right. <clears throat> So the conditional probability distribution is 
probability distribution of one random variable given the value of the other random variable. So if you visualize it in a discrete case, so if you take, if you say what is the probability that x probability of x given y equal into y, it means you are fixing the value of y. It means that you are just looking at this row, not looking at the whole data. Similarly, what is the probability of y given x equal into x? So you are looking at the distribution of this column, not the overall data. Right. So that is the conditional probability distribution in discrete case. So if you visualize this in a continuous case, suppose if you want to see uh, the pixel intensity values in an image. So if you say what is the probability of X given Y equal into Y1. So Y1 is this. Suppose let's suppose Y1 is this. So what is the value of X given Y1? It means you are fixing this row. So it means you're just interested in the distribution of the intensity values in this row, right? So if you see the intensity values distribution, it is this. Whereas if you see the intensity value distribution in this row, this is how the data is distributed here. The intensity values are distributed here. So the probability of X may change according to the underlying distribution. So if y is taking a value y1, the distribution is different. If y is taking a value of y2, the distribution may be different. Right. Now you may be getting a doubt where we use, where, where do we use all these probability distributions? So to clear all the doubts, let's go through one example. Right. So let's go through one example. Let's take a classification problem. So here I've taken a collection of annotated data, labeled data. In this case, five instances of catadids and five instances of grasshoppers, right? To decide what type of insect the unlabeled example is. So we have given five instances of catadids, five instances of grasshoppers. In this figure, actually six instances are there. Now let's say we have taken five instances of grasshoppers, five instances of catadids and five instances of grasshoppers and they are labeled. Now given a new insect image, we should be able to determine whether it is a candidate or grasshopper. Right. So whether it is a candidate or grasshopper. So this is the problem. Simple classification problem, binary classification problem. So for any domain of interest, we can measure the features from the image. Like for example, the features that we may be interested in may be abdomen length of the insect, throat length, or whether it has wings or not, what is the antenna length, or what is the mandible size, what is the spherical diameter, what is the leg length. These are the different features that represent the insect. Okay, so let's not confuse with so many number of features and just take two features. Okay, so let me take two features, abdomen length and antenna length for all these 10 instances that I have taken. Right, so we can store the features in the database and each of the insect, instead of representing that with the image, we have extracted the features from the image and we represent the insect with that features. So these are the features and the corresponding label. Abdominal length, antenna length and the corresponding label. Abdominal length, antenna length and the corresponding label. And like that, I have the 10 examples and the corresponding class labels. Now what is the problem? Given a new instance, 11th instance, for which I only know the abdomen length and antenna length. What is the insect type? I should be able to determine that. Okay, so if I see this grasshoppers from the images that I have got, so these are the instances corresponding to these images. All these are the grasshopper images and all these are the catadid images. Right. Right now if I see, if I see with a lot of data similar to this, not just 10, let's take 100 instances or so With a lot of data, we can build a histogram on antenna length. Let's suppose, let's take a one exam, one uh, feature just uh, to have a simple city, right? So now this is how they are distributed according to their antenna length. So if you see the most of the, uh, most of the, um, most of the, what is this, candidates are distributed around here, isn't it? The frequency is more here, isn't it? And most of the uh, 
grasshoppers are distributed here right so the frequency is more here as you can see right so this is how the catenates and grasshoppers are distributed according to their antenna length so the number of insects with antenna length 10 i mean the number of catenates with antenna length 10 may be around 2 here if you see and number of uh, um, uh, uh, number of catenates with antenna length around here is three probably so like that they are distributed according to their antenna lengths right so we can leave the histograms as they are or we can summarize them with the two normal distributions so if we summarize them this is how they are looking like right the normal distributions i think everyone is familiar with this normal distributions because we follow the normal distribution for grading right so both the students know about it and faculty know about it so let us uh, summarize these two distributions with the normal distributions for the ease of visualization like this. So this is how the insects are distributed according to their antenna lens. So this is the underlying distribution of the insects according to the antenna length, right? So this is the distribution given to us. So this is the underlying distribution of the insects according to their antenna length. Right. Suppose we want to classify an insect we have found and its antenna length is three units long. So how can we classify it now? Right. So we have got new insect whose antenna length is three. So how can we classify it? So we can classify it in a more formal way. What is the probability that it belongs to catadids given this antenna length? And what is the probability that it belongs to uh, grasshoppers given its antenna length. So what is the probability of it is grasshopper given three and what is the probability that it is um, what is the other one catadid uh, given antenna length three. Right. So if you see that what is the probability of grasshopper given antenna length three. So if you see the distribution with this antenna length three we have how many uh, catadids according to this distribution? We have got two catadids. And according to this descent distribution, the number of grasshoppers is 10. 10. Right. So, what is the probability that it is a grasshopper according to this distribution? Total number of insects with antenna length 3 is 12 according to the distribution. Is my audio missing? Could you hear me? Could you hear me or not? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. So somebody is saying that uh, audio is missing. Okay. So ma'am, Maumita, ma'am, please check your audio. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, so so there are total 12 number of insects with antenna length 3 and out of them 10 are grasshoppers and 2 are catadids according to this distribution i'm talking about so the probability of grasshopper given 3 is 10 by 12 which is 0 0.83 and similarly you can compute the probability of catadid given 3 which is equivalent to 0 0.166 right so which label would you assign to this new insect Grasshopper or catadid? Which label would you assign? Grasshopper or catadid? Grasshopper. So we find grasshopper because it is more probable label. Right? Similarly, suppose if you find an insect whose antenna length is 7. So what is the probability that it is a grasshopper and what is the probability that it is a catadid according to this distribution? So the underlying, according to the underlying distribution, we can see the probability of, um, I mean, uh, the frequency of the catadids, frequency of the grasshoppers, and you can compute the corresponding probabilities and assign the label. You can see in this case, we have got the probability of grasshopper as 0 0.25 and probability of catadid as 0 0.75. So therefore, we assign a label of candidate to this particular example. Right.
So according to this probability distribution, these are the probability values. Suppose if the probability distribution is changing, then you may end up with a different probabilities, isn't it? Like the case of uh, the intensity values. You can see at one row, the probability is something like this. At other row, the probability is something like this. Right. So according to the underlying distribution, the probability estimation would change. Probability estimation will be depending on the underlying distribution. OK, so because the data is distributed something like this, we have got the probabilities like this. If the data is distributed in a different way, we may end up with a different probability values for the same examples. OK, so that's what I, that's what I would like to stress here. Right. So to summarize the basic rules that we have discussed so far, we have discussed the sum rule, which is the marginal probability distribution for discrete case probability of x equal into sum over y probability of x comma y, and for continuous case probability of x equal into integral over probability of x comma y dy. And we have also discussed the product rule, which is probability of x comma y is equal into probability of x times probability of y given x, or probability of y times probability of x given and from this, we have derived the Bayesian rule, which is equivalent to probability of y given x equivalent to probability of x given y times probability y divided by probability of x. And this probability of y given x or probability of x given y will change. Probability of x will change according to whether it is a continuous case or discrete case. So we'll just substitute this here. Right. Hard. Also, you remember this chain rule, right? from probability concepts. Probability, joint probability of x1 to xn is probability of x1 times probability of x2 given x1 times probability of x3 given x1 and x2, so on. Probability of xn given x1 to xn minus 1. Okay, so this is the summary of the basic rules that we have discussed so far and all of them are very important for our upcoming sessions. Now let's talk about mean or expectation. So what is the expected value of the outcome or the mean value of the outcome or the average value of the outcome? OK, so let's say that uh, uh, you want to measure the class average marks. Class average marks. OK, and you have, suppose if you have given uh, the individual marks and you want to measure the class average marks, let's say. So you have given uh, student 1 marks 10, student 2 marks 20, student 3 marks 25, something like that. How would you compute the average? 10 times, sorry, so 10 plus 20 plus 25 by 3. This is how we compute the average or the mean value, isn't it? Suppose you have a given information like out of 30 students, 30 students, out of them, 10 students are with marks 20 and 10 students are with marks 25 and 10 students are with marks 30. So how would you measure the average? How would you measure the average? 10 times 20 plus 10 times 25 plus 10 times 30 divided by 30. This is how we measure the right probability. Uh, average, isn't it? Correct? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Right. So, according to the distribution, the underlying distribution, we are multiplying with the corresponding frequencies and taking the average. Okay. So, similarly, here also, the expectation also, or the mean also, we compute according to the underlying distribution of the probabilities. Like for example, imagine that you are tossing a unfair dice. Unfair dice is a weighted cheating dice. It's not a fair dice where the probability is equal for all the for different values, six values. It's an unfair dice and this is the probability distribution of the different values. Probability that it takes value 1 is 0 0.1, 2, 0 0.1 and so on. For 6, it is 0 0.5 a higher probability that it will land up in land up on 6 
So now, what is the mean value for this according to this distribution? Right. So when we know that probability P of X of every value of X, we can calculate the expected value and mean value as something like this. Right. So we multiply the probability with the corresponding value, which is 0 0.1 times 1, which is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 times 2, which is 0 0.2, 0 0.1 times 3, which is 0 0.3, and so on, 0 0.5 times 6, which is 3. So, what is the average value? 4.5. So, the expected value is 4.5. So, this is how you can measure according to the distribution of distribution given to us, expected value. Similarly, expectation of a continuous random variable with the probability density function f of x is integral over state space x f of x dx. We will see the example. So, if you see the example, expected what is the expected diameter of a metal cylinder? So, metal cylinder diameter is taking different values between 49.5 to 50.5, right? So, this is the integral over. 49.550.5. This is the state space, right? Any any value other than this interval, it is zero. So this is the state space, and x times f of x. So you can see that integral over state space x times f of x ds. So this is x times f of x dx. So if you solve this, you would get the average or the mean as the 50. So just for the simplicity, we have taken uh, y equivalent x minus 50. We are changing the variable. So substitute uh, x minus 50, uh, sorry, y in place of x minus 50. So x minus 50, you substitute y, y square, and uh, x equivalent to y plus 50 because y equivalent x minus 50, y plus 50. And if you solve this, you would get 50. Right. So this is how you can measure the expectation of the continuous random variable. So we have seen how to measure the expectation in case of discrete random variable, how to measure the expectation in case of continuous random variable. Expectation or the mean value, average value. And another one, another important thing is the variance of the random variable. So how is it varying? I mean, how uh, the variables are varying around its, how the variables are spread around its mean, spread around its mean right how different are these different values right so the variance is a positive quantity that measures the spread of the distribution of the random variables about its mean so the larger values of the variance indicates that the distribution is more spread out so like for example if the data is something like this then it is more spread out variance is more suppose if the data is something like this if this is less spread out it means the variance is less. So what it is measuring, how the variable uh, uh, different values are spread around its mean. So this is the mean, let's say this is the average or the mean. So we measure the dis distance between the mean and each of these individual values and take the expectation or the average of that according to the distribution, right, with, with a square. So x minus expectation of x. So expectation of x is the mean. X minus expectation of x means difference between each and individual element and its mean uh, and, and the mean of the x, right? And square of that we are taking and expectation of that we are computing. And this is equal to expectation of x square minus expectation of x whole square. This we'll see why we have got this from this, okay? And the standard deviation is the positive square root of the variance. The square root of variance is the standard deviation. Okay, so let's see this now. How we have got this. Variance of x is expectation of x minus expectation of x whole square. So if you expand this, what is the minus b whole square formula? a square plus b square minus 2ab square minus 2ab plus b square, right? So if you expand this, you would get x square minus 2 times x times expectation of x plus expectation of x whole square. So if you expand the expectation, 
So this would be equivalent to expectation of x square minus 2 times expectation of x times expectation of expectation of x which is equivalent to expectation of x plus expectation of x whole square. So this is 2 times expectation of x square plus 2 expectation of x whole square. So minus 2 plus 1 minus 1. So this is how we have got an expectation of x square is x sum over x square times p and minus mean whole square. Expectation of x is the average, right? So which is the mean, right? So let me uh, check there is a question from Bindam. If the variables are not widely distributed means they have a multicollinearity. Can you please explain what do you mean by multicollinearity, Bindam? which is are more related to each other. You cannot say that. That is collinearity. That also we're going to see. Uh, uh, please hold on for uh, five minutes. Maybe we'll see that. OK, so this is how the variance is computed. So if you see the to just to make you realize that difference with um, between mean and uh, the variance. So these are the two different distributions with identical mean. If you see the average of these two, this is same, mu is same, but the variance is different. So this is with a higher variance, the spread is more, this is with the low variance, but the mean is same, right? So to continue with the example, the same example that we have taken, right? Dice example with the probability distributions like this. So to compute the variance, what you have to do? X square P and mu square. So average value we have to compute. The average is 4.5, expectation of X, which we have already computed here. 4.5, mu or expectation of X is 4.5. And variance we need to compute. To, the, to do that, we have to compute X square P. So this is P, probability distribution, and X square times P is this. 1 square times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.1, 2 square times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.4, and so on. Take sum over that, you would get 23.5. So 23.5 minus 4.5 whole square, which is 3.25, which is the variance. So if you want to measure the standard deviation, this is the square root of variance, which is 1.803. Right. The next one is covariance. Right, the ma'am was talking about covariance and correlation. We'll see the correlation also. So let's talk about covariance. How the two variables are varying with one another. So if you take the variance, we are just measuring how one variable is varying with that variable itself. But what is covariance? We are finding the how one variable is varying along with the other variable. Okay, so to do this, we take the expectation of x minus e of x times y minus e of y, right? It means what? This means what? How x is deviating from its mean times how y is deviating from its mean. How x is deviating from its mean and how y is deviating from its mean, right? So let's say I'll give you a very simple example. Suppose you want to measure how the two users are, whether they are similar users or they are dissimilar users. So here X and Y are two random variables. Random variables can be features also sometimes. Yeah. So suppose I'll give you a very simple example. Suppose um, we want to see whether two users are similar users or not based on their ratings how the ratings of one user are varying along with the ratings of the other users. Okay, the variance, right? So, for example, one user may be giving ratings like one, two, three. The other user may be giving ratings like two, three, four. Okay, so to get an opinion that 
whether he is positive about that item or negative about that item. Right? Whether he is positive about that item or negative about that item. Because few users, they may not rate the items as very high. They are very strict. Right? They may give always ratings like one, two, three. Few users, they are very lenient in giving the ratings. They always give in the range of three, four, five, let's say. Okay. So this user, let's say that these are the ratings. Two, three, four, two, let's say. These are the ratings. And this user has given some five, three, four, five, five. So what is his average rating? One plus two, three, three plus three, six, six plus two, eight, eight by four. Average rating is two. His average rating is two. Let's take this user. What is his average rating? Seven plus uh, 10, which is 15 by four, almost four. Okay, so three point something. Let's take it is four. Okay, let's say this is also four. So 16 by four, which is four. Okay, so given a new item, let's say this user has rated it as three. Okay, this user has rated it as three. So whether he is a positive about this item or negative about this item. Anyone quickly? Positive. He is positive because the rating is better Increase. than his average yes. rating. Let's say this user has rated it as three. Then he is probably negative about this item, right? Because three is less than his average, right? So when we multiply this difference between this three and two minus three, average is two, right? So three minus two. So this first one is positive. Sorry. If you take the average four minus three, sorry, sorry, three minus four, y minus expectation of y, he is negative. Right? So if you see this, how they are varying with one another. If one user is positive about one item, the other user is negative about that item. Okay. Similarly, you may have a variance like both of them are positive about certain items or both of them are negative about certain items. Or one of them is positive and both of one of them is negative certain items. So you can measure the variance of two variables together, how they are varying with one another. So this is one variable and this is another variable. So this variance may be a positive number or a negative number. An independent random variable have a covariance of zero. So what does it mean if the covariance is zero? They are completely independent. They are not dependent on the one another. If they are dependent only, they vary with one another. If they are completely independent, they will not vary with one another, isn't it? So they will not vary with one another if they are completely independent. So let's take the air conditioner servicing company example where the company want to measure the covariance between the number of air conditioner units served and the servicing time. How these two variables are varying with one another. So X representing the servicing time in hours and Y representing the number of air conditioner. Sorry, number of air conditioned units served. And this is how the probabilities are distributed. Right? The joint probabilities. Probability that x equivalent to 1 and y equivalent to 1 is 0 0.12. Right? So now, if you see the covariance formula, what is this covariance? Expect this we have derived. You can go through it. It is very simple. Covariance of x comma y is equivalent to expectation of x y time. Uh, x y minus expectation of x times expectation of y. So let's compute expectation of x y, which is the joint expectation. So how do you compute joint expectation? This is one time, one time 0 0.12 plus one time, two times 0 0.18 plus. Can you tell anyone tell me next what is next? One time, 
times 0 0.07. 3 times 0 0.07 plus 1 times 4 times 0 0.05 plus so on 3 times 4 times 0 0.07 which is the last one. So we have got expectation of x, y and we have already known expectation of x and expectation of y which we have computed earlier, right? So if you substitute that, this is the covariance 0 0.224. So there is some covariance between these two variables. So next is correlation. So remember, it can take any positive value and any negative value. Covariance. Whereas the correlation is in between minus 1 and 1 on this. So when two sets of data are strongly linked together, we say that they have high correlation. Okay, so correlation is positive when the values increase together and correlation is negative when one value is decreasing as the other increases. Okay, so maybe, maybe this answers Brinda ma'am's question. So like for example, um, not necessarily ma'am, covariance zero means they're completely independent. So if they're completely independent, maybe, uh, I mean, if they're highly correlated, uh, for example, if you're talking about future selection, because I know that you are from the other course also you are asking about the future selections. That's why I'm answering. Mm. So if they are uh, highly correlated, it means if two features are highly, correlate, highly correlated, it means what? They're representing the same thing. You need not have two different features which represents the same thing. Isn't it? So like, like for example, take two features. Height in meters and height in uh, feet. These two are the two different features. So they, there must be a very high correlation between them, right? If the one is increases, the other is increases. So do you need actually two kinds of features like that? You don't need them, right? You can, you can choose to remove one of them. So that's the idea. So compute the correlation between the features. And there's a high, relation, high correlation. You can choose to remove one of them. So actually, um, what you are saying is partially right. Like, for example, if you see if there is a more spread, like in this case, there is no correlation. Whereas if you see the spread is there, but it is along with one dimension only. OK, the other dimension, there is not that spread. But here is I correlation is there. Yeah. So correlation is positive when the value increases with one another. Like for example, if you see, as the as you increase the value of this x dimension, the value of y is also increasing strictly. Right? There is a strict, this is a perfect positive correlation where the correlation value is one. Whereas if you see, it is not that strict, not perfect, but there is a high positive correlation between the x and y values. As you increase one, the other value is increasing. The correlation is 0 0.9 here. If you see the case of no correlation, you can see it is just spread. It is just randomly distributed. There is no relation between X and Y. It's not like when you increase one, the other one is increasing or decreasing, something like that. Right. So this is no correlation or zero correlation. If you see perfect negative correlation, as you increase the value of one, as you increase the value of X, the y value is decreasing, right, strictly. This is a perfect negative correlation. Here also it is decreasing, but not strictly. So this is a high negative correlation where the correlation value is minus 0 0.9, right? Here also it is decreasing, but it is more spread out. That is why it is minus 0 0.5 correlation. The value shows how good the correlation is and if it is positive or negative, right? So if it is one, it is perfect positive correlation. If it is minus one, then perfect negative correlation. So suppose we want to measure the correlation between the temperature and the sales, ice cream sales. Temperature in centigrade with the number of ice cream sales. So from this graph, from this data, we can easily see that as the um, see that warm the weather is higher sales go together. As you increase the temperature of uh, temperature, the sales are so increasing. So you can also see that the relationship is good, but not perfect. 
right? So the correlation value here is 0 0.9575. Okay, so you see how to calculate this, how to get this minus zero, sorry, 0 0.9575, high correlation and positive correlation, right? So this is how we compute the correlation, covariance of x comma y divided by square root of variance of x times variance of y. And this is value between minus one and one and independent random variables have a correlation of zero. So there is a question. Let me quickly answer. Minus one correlation is like perfect inverse proportionality between two parameters. Yes, yes, Prasad sir. Right. So yeah, uh, so let us compute this ice cream example. These are the points that we have temperature and the corresponding cells, temperature and the corresponding cells like this we have. So first step is compute the means, expectation of X, right? Compute the means. So this is expectation mean here. This is the mean here. Now substitute the mean from each and every element correspondingly. So substitute minus 18.7 from 14.2, you would get minus 4.5. Subtract 16 point, sorry, 18.7 from 16.4, you would get minus 2.3. Like that, substitute this mean from each and individual element. Let's say this is A. Similarly, substitute this mean from individual elements here. So you would get this, B. Now multiply A and B. So which is the numerator part? Multiply A and B, you would get A and B. What is the covariance? How A and B are varying together? Right. Now you have to compute variance. Variance is how A is varying along with B, so which is A square and variance of B, variance of Y, which is B square. Right. So substitute all of them. AB divided by square root of A square times B square. This is AB divided by square root of A square times B square. Right. Which is 0 0.9575. This is how you can get the correlation. Okay. Right, so if you have any queries so far, I'll take. Otherwise, um, we'll go to the probability distributions. I think I may take another 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes, I, can, I may take. Um, so, Balasa session will be delayed a little. Any queries so far, quickly? So, so there is a query from Prashant. So, is there any? All right. Analogous measure like correlation in a univariate uh, case. Uh, variance sir. correlation um, is one there because if there is a univariate case, it means only one is there, right? One variable. You want to measure how that variable is varying along with the other one. So it means the correlation is one. Because suppose if you substitute, if you take both uh, x and x here. What is the covariance of x and x which is equivalent to variance of x divided by square root of variance of x times variance of x which is equivalent to variance of x. So therefore this is equivalent to variance of x divided by variance of x. So this is equivalent to 1. So this is 1 sir always. Is that clear? Yeah. So these are the some common probability distributions. I'll quickly go through them because we have already crossed the time. Uh, so these are some of the important probability distributions. We'll be using them extensively to model the data as well as the parameters. Right. So some of the discrete probability distributions uh, and what they can model is given here. Bernoulli, it, it can model the binomial uh, binary numbers like outcome of coin tossing, head or tail, zero or one. Binary numbers, it can model. Binomial distribution, it is bounded non-negative numbers, it can model. For example, it can model the number of heads in n coin tosses. Multinomial model is an extension of binomial. In binomial case, we take uh, only binary values, like one of the two possible values, like for example, heads and tails. Whereas in multinomial, we can take more than two values. We will see the example. Poison distribution for non-negative integers, like for example, if you want to count the number of words in a document, 
and there are many other uh, discrete probability distributions. Uh, discussing all of them is outside the scope of this session. These are the some of the continuous distribution probability functions, uniform, beta, gamma, Dirichlet, Gaussian. We're going to see uniform and Gaussian distributions here. So let's start with binomial probability distribution, which is the discrete case. So this is for a fixed number of observations, like n, for example, 15 classes of a coin, 20 patients that you have observed, or the 100 people are surveyed. So n is fixed. How many number of times the experiment is conducted, which is fixed. And you should have a binary random variable, like for example, heads or tails in toss of a coin, defective or not. Uh, or uh, if you generalize it, whether it is a success or failure. And the probability of success is P, probability of failure is 1 minus P. And the constant probability for each observation. Like for example, if you see the probability of heads, it is 0 0.5 always. We cannot say in one experiment it is 0 0.5, in another experiment it is 0 0.6. You can fix it to 0 0.6 in all the experiments. You can fix it to 0 0.7 in all the experiments, but you cannot vary it. In, a, in one experiment, you say that probability of heads is 0 0.5. In another experiment, if you say 0 0.6, then it will not. This will not be uh, applicable for binomial probability distribution. Right? The constant probability for each observation. So let's take an example. Take the example of five coin tosses. So what is the probability that you flip exactly three heads in five coin tosses? You're tossing the coin but five times. What is the probability exactly three heads? So what are the possibilities? When you flip a coin five times, this is one possibility. First one is tail, second, third, fourth are heads, and fifth one is tail. This is one possibility where you get three heads. This is another possibility where you get three heads and so on. This is another possibility where you get three heads. So how many ways that you can get three heads out of five? Five C three number of ways you can arrange three heads out of five outcomes, isn't it? Agree? Five C three number of times. Right. And what is the probability of this? Probability of this is the individual probabilities multiplied together as they are independent of one another. Probability of tails is 0 0.5. Probability of heads is 0 0.5. Probability of heads is 0 0.5. Probability of heads is 0 0.5. Probability of tails is 0 0.5. So which is altogether 0 0.5 power 5. Right? So the probability of this is 0 0.5 power 5, 0 0.5 power 5, so on 0 0.5 power 5. So 10 arrangements. So what do you do? The probability of each unique outcome, they are all equal. So there are 5C3 ways of arranging head, 3 heads in 5 trials and therefore 10 possible outcomes you would get. Right? So therefore probability of heads and three heads and two tails is equal to 5c3 times probability of heads power 3 times probability of tails power 2. So which is equal to 0 0.3125. Probability of three heads and two tails is equal to 0 0.3125. So this is an example of binomial distribution which is used to model the positive numbers. Like for example, what is the probability of uh, the outcome taking three heads? Right. So, so the distribution may change according to the probability values. The distribution may change according to the probability values, the number of heads tossed in five costs. So this is how it is distributed if it is probability is 0 0.5. Whereas if you take different probabilities, probability of heads is 0 0.184, then you can see this is right skewed. If you take probability of 0 0.486, then this is what and you would get. For different probabilities, this distribution may change. And binomial distribution is a special case of the binomial distribution where n value is equal to 1, right? So binomial with n equal to 1 is 
Bernoulli distribution. So if there is only one trial, not n trials, and probability of success is p, and probability of failure is one minus p. So probability success of is p, and probability of failure is one minus p. Multinomial distribution is the generalization of the binomial. It is used when there is more than two possible outcomes. Like for example, here we are taking head or tails, right? Like that, if we have more than two outcomes, right? Like ordinal or nominal, rather than binary random variables. So in that case, we go for multinomial distribution. Like so, this is the generalized formula for that for three outcomes. So suppose if there are three random variables, D, R, G. And what is the probability that d equivalent to x, r equivalent to y, and z equivalent to z? This is equivalent to n factorial by x factorial by factorial z factorial times probability of d power x, probability of r power y, and so on, and the probability of z power z. Right? So let's take an example. Suppose if you are randomly choosing eight people from an audience. Uh, and that contain 50% Democrats, 30% Republicans, and 20% Green Party members. Now, question is, what is the probability of choosing exactly four Democrats, three Republicans, and one Green Party member? So, what is the probability that D equivalent to four, R equivalent to three, and one equal G equivalent to one? And you know the probabilities. Probability of D is 0.5, 50%. And probability of R is 30% and probability of G is 20%, 0.2. Okay, so take power of the corresponding numbers, 0.5 power 4, 0.3 power 3, 0.2 power 1. So you would get this probability. This is, this is how you can compute multinomial. Okay, so another distribution is Poisson distribution and the Poisson distribution is for counts. So if the events happen at a constant rate over time, the Poisson distribution gives the probability of X number of events occurring in time t. Like for example, number of events that occur in some interval. Event could be, uh, I mean, unit could be time, length, area, space, it can be anything. So if you take the example, number of customers arriving in 20 minutes, a number of strikes per year in India, a number of defects per lot of DVDs, group of DVDs, so these are all things you can uh, model using Poisson distribution. We'll give example. This is the probability distribution function, lambda power x times e power minus lambda by x factorial, where lambda is the mean and e is base of natural logarithm and x is the number of events per unit. So this is an example. Suppose customers arriving at a rate of 72 per hour. What is the probability of four customers arriving in three minutes? So I'll repeat it. Customers arriving at a rate of 72 per hour. So what is the probability of four customers arriving in three minutes? So what is the unit here? Three minutes, right? So 72 per hour, it means 1.2% per minute. If you compute 72 by 60, 1.2. And it means 3.6 per 3 minutes of interval. So if you compute the probability of x, probability of 4 members arriving in 3 minutes, it would be equivalent to the average value, which is 3.6 per 3 minutes, average value per unit. Unit here is 3 minutes interval. So 3.6 per 3 minutes, that is why average lambda is 3.6. 3.6 power x, x is 4. Right, times e power minus 3.6 divided by 4 factorial, which is 0 0.1912. Right, so like that you can compute the uh, um, events per some interval, probability of even per some interval. Uniform probability distribution, which measures, um, let's say that you are considering a random variable x which is representing the flight time of an aeroplane traveling from chicago to new york so this is a random variable x representing the flight time of an aeroplane traveling from chicago to new york so the flight time can be any time between 120 minutes to 140 minutes right 
So because it is, it can be any value between 120 minutes to 140 minutes. This is a continuous variable, right? And this is uh, with every minute interval being equally likely. The random variable X is said to have a uniform probability distribution because every minute is equally likely. So for 120 to 140 minutes, the distribution is 1 by 20 and 0 elsewhere. So if you, so this is how you can represent uh, if you generalize it for A less than or equal to B, X less than or equal to B, this is 1 by B minus A is 0 otherwise. So if you substitute flight times A equal to 120 and B equal to 140, you would get 1 by 140 minus 120, that is 1 by 20. That's what we have seen right here, 1 by 20. So this is the area that is indicating the probability that flight will arrive in the interval between 120 and 140 minutes. Suppose you are interested in knowing what is the probability that flight will arrive in between 120 to 130 minutes. So it means what you are interested in this area. This area, isn't it? You are interested in this area. So what is the area? of a rectangular, you know that, right? If, so this is what 10 and this is 1 by 20. So what is the area of this rectangle? 10 times 1 by 20, which is 1 by 2. Yes. Right. So that is how you can get. Suppose if you are interested in uh, the probability that uh, x takes a value between 120 and 130. And very important uh, probability distribution. We'll be using it most often in our coming uh, sessions, which is the normal distribution. Okay, so this is to model the continuous random variable, and it is widely used for market static statistical inferences in both natural and social sciences. So it is being used in varieties of applications, like to model the height of the people. So if you see the height of the people. You can see that it follows the normal distribution, isn't it? Very few people with more height, very few people with less height, many number of people with the average height, isn't it? And similarly, scientific measurements and test scores also follow this normal distribution as we all know. Very few people with very high marks, very few people with very low marks. Many of them are around average. And uh, amount of rain falls. All this follows the normal distribution. And this is the probability distribution function for the normal distribution. 1 by sigma square root of 2 pi e power minus x minus mu whole square divided by 2 sigma square. I think most of you may be familiar with this as you all may be working on this, where mu is the mean and sigma is the standard deviation. Pi is of course 3.14 and e is the natural logarithm 2.71, right? So this is how you can model the normal distribution. So there are some characteristics of this normal distribution. Distribution is symmetric and bell-shaped. So like this, it is symmetric and bell-shaped. And uh, the entire family of normal probability distribution by defined by mu, mean mu and its standard deviation sigma. And the highest point on the normal curve is at the mean. The peak is at the mean. So this peak point is at the mean, which we also call median and mode. And the mean can be any numerical value. It can be negative, zero, or positive. So with zero mean, you can see that. It's negative mean, you can see this is the curve. With zero mean, this is the curve. And with uh, positive mean, that is the curve. And the standard deviation determines the width of the curve. So larger value result in a wider and flatter curves. You can see this is with a smaller uh, standard deviation. This is with a higher, larger value standard deviation. You can see the larger value standard deviation. We have got the flatter and wider curve. And here, uh, the whole, the total area under curve is one. And because it is a symmetric, 0.5 left side of the curve and 0.5 right side of the curve, I mean from the mean. Right side or left side determined by mean, from the mean. And there is a standard normal distribution with zero mean. Um, 
uh, Sharma, I'll come to your question. Let me quickly finish. Uh, standard normal distribution, as we have already crossed the time. Standard normal distribution uh, is a special case of normal distribution with zero mean and standard deviation one, right? So the, let's say that letter Z is used to designate the standard normal variable. So if I, right? So this is the probability that Z less than or equal to one is the area under the curve to the left of one, right? So there is a cumulative probability table for the standard normal distribution. Cumulative probability table for the standard normal distribution, some, something like this. So you can get this table with the, for the standard normal distribution. So cumulative probability distribution table we call it as. So I'll see how to refer to this table and we'll solve some problems based on that. So if you check this cumulative probability distribution table, if Z is Z is the value representing this uh, uh, random variable representing this distribution, right? So Z less than or equal to one can be referred in the table like this. So Z value one and the second decimal point is zero, 1.00, one means 1.00, right? So probability that Z less than or equal to one is 0.8413. So can anyone tell me from the table, what is the probability that Z less than or equal to 1.1? Anyone quickly? What is the probability that Z less than or equal to 8643? 8643. Okay, one, yeah, 8643, yes. So, I, sorry, I have asked the wrong question. What is the probability that less than or equal to 1.01? Yeah, you are correct. What Z less than or equal to 1.1 is that? What is the probability that Z less than or equal to? Yeah, 8438. Yes. This is how you can refer to this table. Right. So now the question is, what is the probability that from this table, what is the probability that Z less than or equal to 2.46? If I say that Z follows the standard normal distribution. So 2.46, it means what? 2.46, 2. 2.46, 0. 0.9199931, 0. 0.9931 we have got. So what is the probability that Z greater than or equal to 4.16, which means this area, we know that the total area is 1 and this area is 0. 0.9931. So 1 minus 0. 0.9931 is 0. 0.0069. And suppose if you are interested in what is the probability that Z less than or equal to minus 1.29, right, which is this, right. You know that this is a symmetric curve and probability that Z less than or equal to minus 1.29 is equal to uh, this Z greater than or equal to 1.29, right. So which is equal to 1 minus 0 0.9015, right. Z greater than or equal to 1.29 is 1 minus probability that Z less than or equal to 1.29. So you can get this from the table and substitute that. And similarly, you can get Z greater than or equal to minus 1.29. Right? Both are. Right. So this is the test book, which is a very good reference for this. I have already shared this test book on the Google Drive. If you're interested, you can download it. So thank you very much. Happy learning. Uh, there is a doubt in the chat box. Let me answer that. Is there any, okay. So this is already done. Is the count of observations are the same. Okay, just answering something. Okay. So any queries, I'll quickly take. When we will start the implementation of this no we will start the implementation these are all the basic concepts ma'am so there is no implementation for these probability concepts uh, but whenever the um, uh, actual machine learning topic starts we will start the implementation so i have already shared the google drive on your mail please check your mails or you can Hello, check sir. in the drive also uh, in the drive also you can find that folder in your drive shared with me you can open shared with me you will see that yeah 
sir, I have a question uh, request. Yes, yes, please. Uh, I mean, uh, could you uh, uh, in the in the prospect of the code? Good evening all. Welcome to the second session. Am I audible? Good evening, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, in this session, we'll continue with the Python. So today's session will uh, cover NumPy, Pandas, and uh, visualization. Although one session may not be enough. I will try to cover the basic things that are required. So first we'll see. We'll start with okay, let me record our recording. I started day two. Okay. So we'll start with this numpy. So numpy is like the data structure array in your other programming languages. So we have already seen list. Although list, uh, it is like it is holding the values, although it holds heterogeneous values, you can store homogeneous values also in the list, right? But the problem is it, uh, you see, if you see the structure of list, suppose if you define some list, list, and if you write one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and we have seen, list plus list what it will give it will concatenate this is not an addition operation if you see right this we have already seen yesterday and then not only this there are many other differences so you see it was concatenating the elements okay it was concatenating the elements right it is not performing the addition operation and all these things so if you want to perform matrix operations then this there is a library in python it is called numpy. So you can uh, import any library in Python using an import statement. So import numpy. This is the syntax. Then you can use all the functions inside this numpy library. So if you want to suppose if you want to call some function in inside numpy library, then you have to call numpy dot that function, right? So instead of call, writing this function every time, you can use a shortcut notation. So for that, we use the keyword as. So import numpy as np. This is the general uh, uh, general word used for numpy. You can use any name here. If I if I want to use bala, I can use bala also. If I use bala, then what what I have to do? If suppose I wanted to use some function inside this numpy, then I have to call bala dot dot one. 
it will simply work. So this is the basic syntax of importing any library. Here I am importing, so let me keep it np only. I am importing uh, this numpy. So let me post also today. You can run with me. Okay, I am I am posting in chat box. Okay. So this is the syntax for importing numpy array. Now suppose let us define some uh, something. So this np there is a function called array, and if you pass list, it will convert into array. Like yesterday we have seen list list this list set tuple. These functions we have seen, right? What it will do? It will convert. If you give something as input, then it will convert into list. Similarly, here, if you give list as input, it will convert into numpy array. You see what will happen? Okay, this I have not executed now. I have changed the name from Bala to np. Now I will I will run it. You see, it is a, it is an array. Can you see? This is a proper array. Why I am saying proper array? Okay, let me see. Now. Let us define a plus a. What will happen a plus a? It is adding. Can you see the actual addition operation is being performed on this array rather than concatenating and all. There are many other differences of number array with uh, from list. So basically list doesn't support values like nan and all these things. Suppose if you have some uh, value and if you want to find minimum marks, okay, let us let me define uh, rather than showing. Suppose if you if you have something like nan number that is uh, undefined okay nan now let me define this one first this is my list nan what is this nan what this this one no it was not allowing actually nan is not defined np dot nan or what okay okay so it doesn't support okay i i hope it will uh, take these things at least na na is also not defined na oh na is also not defined okay no issue so basically this uh, numpy works with these undefined values also nan values also whereas list if uh, the list contains these nan values and if you calculate min or max then it will throw errors it will throw errors for list, whereas for numpy arrays it will work with uh, everything. Now, having defined this uh, numpy array, let me post this one. I have posted, I am posting this one. You can run it. So, we have defined this numpy array. Now, similar to list, you can access the elements using index. Suppose you want to, let us say, let me store this one in B. Okay, A, A, okay, let, let me, let me call it B. Okay. Now, if you want to access elements inside B, then how to access B of 1? What is B of 1? Element at first index is 4. So, you can perform indexing. You can perform slicing. Slicing we have already discussed, so I am not covering. You can perform slicing on the NumPy array. You can uh, use the negative indexing like yesterday we have seen, right? Negative indexing you can use. Uh, all these things you can use, the uh, concepts that we have discussed yesterday, okay? Now, we can define uh, two-dimensional uh, two dimensional numpy arrays also. How to de define two-dimensional numpy array? Same way, you can define a two-dimensional list and pass it to numpy array, it will create. Now, so you can, you know how to create two-dimensional uh, list, right? 2D list, let me call it 2D list. How to create 2D list? This is one by one, this is first row, first row, this is for second row, this is third row. Let us say I am defining it. Three rows. Let me define one, two, three. Means three elements in each row. Four, five, six. Okay. Then seven, eight, nine. So this is 2D list. Right. It is error. Invalid syntax or 2D. Basically, it won't take this way. List two. Let me call it a list 2D. First number should not be a, uh, so the name of name of a variable or name of the list or name of a tuple name of a dictionary should not start with a number. I have given two D list. That's why it is throwing this error. Now you simply give it to np dot array list two D. It will create a two D array. 
Now similar same, you can use the indexing, you can use slicing, you can use negative or negative indexing, all these things you can do. Now let me skip all these things. You can create these two dimensional, three dimensional arrays, lists and all these things. Now, uh, what I discuss is I discuss some of the uh, functions that are supported by this uh, NP. Suppose, let us say we have, we have an empire array and you wanted to calculate, let us say where is the empire array? B is there, okay. B, what is B? What is there in B, you see? What is there in B? This one. Now, you can perform all kind of operations. It supports np.main. If you give this uh, array as input, it will calculate main, it will calculate median, it will calculate standard deviation also. If you want to calculate standard deviation, simply call std. If you want to calculate median, this is not the right, uh, this one, but median also it supports. Median can be calculated. Median, let me give. Yeah, median, yeah, right. See, you can calculate all these things. You can calculate all these statistical parameters that are required uh, from a array or from a matrix. You can call this function and then it will calculate all these things. Okay, now this NP, this NumPy supports some functions also. What are those functions? Let me first discuss this, this function. This is one of the most important function. So A range, you see A range, what it will uh, give? It will return evenly spaced values within a given interval. So it is like range. Yesterday we have seen the range function, right? It is same as range function. You see, if I give A range of 10, what will it, what it will return? It will return 0 to 9. This we have seen, not but not including 10, right? We can give starting index also, 1 to 10, right? We know this, 1 to 10, what it will give? same 1 to 9 it will give elements from 1 to 9. So similarly, this NP supports a function called reshape. We can reshape this, suppose here, how many elements it generates? 1 to 10 means it will generate 9 elements. You can reshape into 3 by 3. You can give 3 by 3. You see what will happen now? It, now you see, we have created a 3 by 3 matrix by generating these uh, nine numbers then we have we, sh we have changed the shape into a matrix this way we have generated let me post this one not everything but uh, this kind of things i will post is it okay are you able to run these commands this is uh, this doesn't require anything because sir can you show yeah yeah hello two dimensional thing okay yeah yeah Two dimensional thing, this one. That's all. I am simply I have created to a two dimensional list and I am passing. Yeah, I am sharing, madam. I have posted in chat box. So this is by passing a list, we have created a 2D array. Now, here what we did? We have generated nine numbers, then we have changed the shape of those nine numbers to three by three. Right. Okay, now suppose here these a range what it will generate it will generate a sequence of numbers one two three and so on like this now suppose you wanted to generate uh, random numbers so before going to random numbers if you want to generate uh, fractional numbers rather than integers i wanted to generate fractional numbers how how so you see we, we have seen this a range what it will do it will generate evenly spaced numbers from one to ten with step length of one now suppose you want to generate fractional numbers but that they are evenly separated how to how to generate them there is a function called lin space linearly separated numbers you see why it will give the description written evenly spaced numbers over a specified interval can you see so what are the parameters start stop number of points and so on okay you see so if i give zero and one and 10 points. So what does this mean? The number should be between 0 and 1. And how many numbers I want to generate? 10 numbers. So you want to generate 10 evenly spaced, spaced uh, numbers between 0 and 1. That means what? 0 to 0 0.1, one number. 1 to 2, one means 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, one more number. 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, one more number, this way. So let us let us see the output. Can you see this lin space? Now you see 
0 to 0 0.1, 1 number, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 1 number, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, 1 number, like this. They are evenly, sp evenly spaced. Can you see? So let me paste this one also. So we have seen how to generate uh, evenly spaced integers and evenly spaced fractional point values, right? So similarly, if you change here, 0 to 10, if I want to generate 50 points, still it will generate evenly. You see, all these points are generated. Can you see? So you can change these values and you can uh, play with them. Now, so these are evenly spaced numbers. But uh, if you want random numbers, how to generate random numbers? Again, this NumPy supports some function called np.random. So np NumPy, there is a submodule random. So in this submodule, there are many functions. So first we'll see rand integers. So first let me see what is the syntax of this rand integers. Rand into, uh, that's why it is random. not rand integers. Yeah, you see, it returns random integers from, so you see what are the parameters, low and high and size means how many numbers you want. You can give all this. So these are random integers. So let us say you want to generate 0 and 500. I want to generate some 50 random integers. Can you see the random integers? We have generated random integers. You can generate them randomly. Is it okay? Any questions? These are simple commands. Uh, I hope the... Yeah, okay. So, okay, now these are random integers. Now, on the other hand, suppose you wanted to generate random numbers. I mean, numbers means fractional numbers rather than uh, random. Random dot random give some 50 numbers so it will generate it will create numbers between 0 and 1 now you see what is the output what it will generate it will generate 50 numbers between 0 and 1 you see they are power 10 power uh, 0 0.1 this is you see so 5.34 into 0 0.1 that means what this is 0 0.54 0 0.534 this is 0 0.357 this is 0 0.324 and so on so we have generated integers, we have generated floating point numbers between 0 and 1. Now can someone tell me how to generate floating point numbers within any range? Random, random numbers. Random floating point numbers, not between 0 and 1, 0 to any range. How to generate? Can someone, uh, can someone give an idea how to generate? floating point numbers between any range. So this random, what it is doing? It is giving uh, floating point values between 0 and 1 only. Now, can someone tell how to generate 50 floating point numbers between 0 and 500? Can someone post in chat box how to generate 50 floating point numbers between 0 and 500? This command will generate integers. It will not generate uh, so based on the existing commands we can generate please uh, try can we generate 50 floating point numbers between 0 and 500 how to generate rand float okay okay rand float based on these commands only based on these commands only we can generate how i, I first i generate 50 integers between 0 and 500 then i will add these floating point numbers between 0 and uh, so this is floating point number. So let me give 50. It will generate values between 0 and 1. So now I simply add. Both are random. Right? First command is random, second command is random. So therefore the output is also random. You see. Is this okay? This way also you can generate. Any questions? Let me post this one. This is enough. Uh, okay. That random dot. Uh, random dot. Uh, that uh, random. Uh, for me, it's uh, some other random number. Is that okay? Some yeah, that's okay, madam. So 
if you want same random numbers, there is something called random dot seed. You have to give this seed. This is generally used in random number generation. Random dot seed. Yeah, seed. We have to give you give ten madam like this. Now generate. Uh, I hope our results will be same. You see, you give some seed and then generate. Please try this one. Let me post otherwise. This code, you can run. Are you getting, madam? Hello? Hello? I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm getting in the range of 134.77 and uh, that starts from 134 and it ends with 337. Okay, the same command. Now, you, you have executed these commands, two commands together? Yeah, yeah, I have executed, but uh, the uh, thing is, uh, I, uh, where, where I'm get, when I'm using the np random dot random 50, uh, I'm not getting in the power of minus three. I'm getting a point six one six four like that. That is okay, man. This is scientific notation. That's all. You are. You see, where is that one? Let me show. Where is that one? Random int in space. After the int, you have the, we had the random dot random, no? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Actually, that is. Uh, let me write here np dot random dot random that's what you are selling right random dot random, random, uh, random dot yeah, 50. in 50 that we that, wrote. That, that is okay man so this is basically both are same this is scientific notation now you say i'm getting same thing actually earlier i'm getting that is scientific notation 3.15 into 10 power minus one so they will write as 3.15 e, uh, e uh, means uh, 10 power uh, means minus point uh, zero 0.01 that's all that is scientific notation that's all okay no need to worry that notation, but uh, values are between zero and one only. So, I, uh, did you execute these two commands, madam? Yes, I have done it. Now, are you getting same thing or different? I'm getting the different value. Okay, different value. Then, okay. yeah, random. Yeah, here it is there. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's generating some other random number, right? Yeah. Uh, name itself, it is random. No need to worry. Yeah. So now let me tell other commands. NP dot random dot uniform. Uniform, yeah, I think uniform is there. So it will generate uniform numbers. So that means uniform distribution. I, I hope it was discussed. So it will generate numbers using uniform distribution. You see, these are the parameters low zero point. Uh, so numbers between zero and one. You can give zero and one 50 samples. So now the elements will be generated using a uniform distribution. Similarly, if you want to generate using uh, random dis uh, normal distribution, random dot random, you give random, n stands for normal distribution. You say return a sample or samples from standard normal distribution. That's all. So you can try all these commands. Uh, it is difficult to explore all the commands now. So this way it supports many uh, useful functions. Mm -hmm. It's randomized, random, you can generate random numbers, then you can reshape them, then you can calculate uh, different uh, metrics like mean, median, standard deviation, all these things you can, uh, you can perform. Similarly, you can uh, uh, combine two arrays, combine two arrays. So we have seen that uh, Plus will not work for concatenation. Suppose if you have two arrays, if you want to concatenate, there is a command called np dot concatenate. You can use the you can you can use it np dot concatenate. You can try. So do I have something? Let me give a equals to one two. Let me define oh np dot array right np dot random np dot random dot rand int let me generate two arrays and let me concatenate and int 0 to 10 three numbers okay b equals to same thing i will uh, generate zero to 20 six numbers now i want to concatenate a comma b i will simply give a comma b Yeah. 
it is issue only integer scalars can be converted to scalar index so actually np dot h stack at least it will work h stack oh these are six numbers okay let me because it is like array that's why you see the first one is of size three and the second one is of size six i'm trying to concatenate that's why i'm getting this error so let me generate three numbers then let me concatenate okay, let me generate three numbers now now let me concatenate still it is not okay okay integer scalars cannot be converted into scalar index ram int it should work okay no issue there are some other commands np dot h stack let me see h stack a comma b okay it is also not working h stack and uh, these commands but uh, they should work actually np dot concatenation also it should work yeah okay i hope uh, I'm uh, passing differently. I think I have to pass this like this a comma b. Yeah, this way. You see, I am concatenating. Uh, these are the elements inside a. First three are uh, the elements inside a, and then these three are the elements inside b, and then I am adding. Okay, h stack means horizontally. So row wise, these three elements, then these three elements will be added in the same row. If you want to add uh, as a row means uh, if you want to add a new row then give v stack vertically it will add same thing vertically a comma b now you see the output it is vertically these are the numbers that were generated in a these are the numbers that were generated in b this way you can concatenate so problem with uh, the syntax okay so there are many other functions that are supported by numpy i am not going through all those things so now let us let me go to this pandas pandas library so python supports a library called pandas for data processing so this panda is a library for data processing data you can do pre processing you can do all these kind of things we'll see what we can do we can do we can fill missing values we can fail, we can remove duplicate rows from the data all these things so basically this pandas has two important data structures so the first one is called series the second one is called data frame so first we'll see how exactly this series works uh, series uh, works so this series can take a list as an input or a dictionary as an input so first let me tell you how to import this pandas you can simply write import pandas you can give some shortcut name pd let me give pd only okay now let us see how to generate a series using a list so there is a command called pd dot series so that means what it is like it will convert the input to series so let me give a list as an input one two no rather than one two let me give uh, 45 56, 78, 12, 36, 89. Let's let me give this one. Now you see the output of pandas. You see? So if you see this one, it may look like uh, a numpy array. But what is the difference? The difference is that it is giving these explicit indices. You see, earlier we have created numpy array. Where is the numpy array? One numpy array we will see. Yeah, this is numpy array. Now Suppose if you store this output somewhere, let, let me call it some uh, AB. Okay. Now, if you want to access the first element in AB, how to access the first element? AB of 0 will give you 0. AB of 1 will give you 0 0.23, 0 0.20, right? This we know. That is called indexing. But here, what is the difference? PD dot series, when we created series, it was giving explicit indices. That means what? It was explicitly showing uh, these indices. So what is the advantage of these explicit indices? Although it is giving these default, default indexes, 
you can give your own indexes. How to give your own indexes? There is an option called index. For this index, you pass on. You pass. No need to pass only integers. You can give uh, strings also. Let me give some strings. Okay, A. Let me give A, B, C, D, E. How many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. A, B, C, D, E, F. Let me give. Okay, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, five I have to give A, B, C, D, E, F. Let me run it now. Can you see now? I have given explicit indices. Now, if you want to access a particular element, how you can access? So let me store it somewhere first. Huh? Let me call it as a series, right? So this is SD. Let me call it as SD. Now let me let me run once again. So that is the output of SD. Now, if you want to access something, you can access using these explicit indexes. So that means if I give SD of A, what it will give? It will give 45. First element. SD of F, it will give 89. So this is the other advantage of uh, pandas or numpy arrays. So it supports explicit indexing. You can give explicit row indexes. Similarly, you can give explicit column indexes also. So column indexes means what? In data frame, uh, it will be clear data frame. So basically, the difference between series and data frame is that series is a one-dimensional uh, series is analogous to one D one D array, one D numpy array, whereas data frame is analogous to 2D array. Okay. So basically, series is 1D, data frame is 2D. There is other data structure called panel that is 3D and a higher, higher D, uh, 4D, 5D, and a higher dimensional. Okay. So now, now I will not show you how to generate a series using dictionary because it is same. If we pass dictionary, it will create, uh, it will create a, a series object. Now, if you wanted to, if you see I, what I will tell, SD of Zero. What it will give you? SDF zero. It will give forty-five. So by default, although we have given these explicit indexes, it will work with implicit indexes also. Implicit index means what? By default, the index starts with zero. First row is zero. Sir, we will copy the code that the index. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Sorry. Because I'm getting an error. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Six. Because six uh, elements are there. I am giving six rows were there. So in index, we gave six values. That's all. I have posted. Yeah, this is explicit indexing. Using SD of A, you can access. Similarly, SD of zero also you can access. SD of zero means this is called implicit indexing. Okay, so let me not uh, focus on that one. So now quickly we'll go to data frame. Data frame is uh, very much useful for us. So what is this data frame? Data frame, as I mentioned, uh, it is two dimensional. So it is like it will create tabular kind of structure, tabular data. So we'll see what do you mean by this tabular data? Suppose uh, you have some, okay, let me, okay. Later on I will tell you. So import pandas as pd so rather than working with this uh, simple simple data let me directly tell you how to read big big data okay using data frame so pd dot there is a function called pd dot data frame okay now this panda supports many functions so if you want to read a CSV file, you can directly read a CSV file. Let me see if there are some CSV files in my drive in my system. So since I am working in Google Drive, let me first import some file. Importing some file means what? I will tell you. First, let me get some file. Let me upload some file to my Google Drive, Google Colab. So how to upload a file to Google Colab? It supports these two using these two commands. You can upload a file to Google Colab from Google dot Google dot collab import import files. That means what from this 
library there is this submodule files now this files supports a function called upload files dot upload you give it to you, you can store it in some name uploaded uploaded equals to files dot upload now you see what will happen when i run this one can you see this one what it is asking it was asking me to upload some file let me see if i have some uh, comma separated files or any file or let me upload first okay where is the upload let me some data i have big data sets irish that data i have data set you loading example i have some fake data set i have where is this fake data so let me upload some fake data one data i have downloaded where is that one One moment, yeah. Yeah, dirty data. Let me upload this dirty data. This is comma separated file. Can you see this is comma separated file? So I am uploading this comma separated file. So later on I will read using read.csv. Now I have uploaded. Now where to see this file? If you click on this one, can you see this dirty data.csv file? You can see right, all of you. Okay. So now if you want to read this CSV file simply give that one now it was in your uh, your files folder only so what is the name actual name dirty dot uh, dirty data dot csv so let me pass this file dirty data dot csv let me store the output in somewhere now you see what will happen let me print it let me print df what is there in df can you see can you see what is there in this dirty data so that csv file was converted to a data frame basically this is called data frame data frame means two dimensional now you see these are the column names this is column name one this is column name two this is column name three so now if you want to access an individual column how to access you d d you see these are the column names if you want to access something if i wanted to access duration you give duration what is df dot duration this is the df dot duration now let me first uh, print everything then let me show you see okay now if you want to access some column give it df dot duration this will access this will give you the particular column the uh, column you wanted to work with is it okay any questions here let me po post the data let me post the code uh, you need file also right if you have some csv file please upload in your system if you have some csv file please upload let me post this code i have posted it please upload some csv file from your system and see what it will generate Similarly, if you want to read an Excel file, you can read an Excel file also. How to read an Excel file? Same instead of read underscore CSV. Instead of read underscore CSV. First, let me import some file. I'm importing one file, one Excel file. Let me import on every Excel file. So where is an Excel file? Uh, Let me use some Excel file. Is this Excel? Sir, you can, excuse me, sir. You can go a little bit slow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because it takes time for upload and then to see the results from our side. Okay, okay then. Please upload. Yeah. Please upload. Uh, let's see. Can you see this output? In first cell, you run these two commands, upload some CSV file, 
then you check here that file should come here in this files folder this is the folder folder symbol so this dirty dot dot csv will come here then run these two commands and pass on that file whatever file uh, you have uploaded i have uploaded this dirty data dot csv Can you repeat for the Excel file uh, uploading? Yeah, what yeah. should be the command? Same, same command. Yeah, let me tell you now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, let me first upload some file. Okay, I have so, done that. Yeah. Let, let me upload something, and let me okay. show you because sure. I have to show you. some file. Where is it? CSV? Okay. Let me upload this one. First year faculty <laughs> data. Let us say this is Excel page. Let me upload this on participant list. Okay. Yeah. So I hope it was uploaded. Let me see. Yeah, participant list dot XLT. Now there is a command same instead of read underscore. So here you write that PD dot read underscore. Excel, you see this Excel command. Okay, okay. Instead of CSV, I should make it. Yeah, yeah, then pass on that file. Okay. Yeah, that's all. And you can see the output. Rename file. Let me pass on this Excel. Bit. You see, it was uploaded. Can you see this is in a tabular format? This 87 rows and uh, all the information was uploaded. So, this way you can upload your data sets. If you have your data inside some Excel file or CSV file, you can upload that CSV file using this uh, pandas. And you can convert it to data frame. Data frame means like it is like table. Yeah. Some questions. Hello. So please move up slightly. Yeah, yeah. We need to give the full extension, huh? Like yeah, full um, extension. Yeah. Yeah, XLX, XLX. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it is showing me error. Yeah, please, please give that one. Please give full extension. Still it is showing me error. I don't know what is that error. So uh, did you upload an Excel file? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have uploaded. Then uh, can you check here? Whether it came dot Excel is X. Dot Excel is yeah. X. Excel, Excel is X, I did. Okay, but still, you see, I gave Excel. Excel, see, sir, is written as E X C E L. Yeah, E X C L. It will come automatically. You see, this way. Let me show you here. In Google Colab, it will come. You see, let me run here. PD dot read. You see, it was coming. I yeah. selected read Excel, read HTML file. You can read JSON file. You can read all these files. You see. Different files. All these it supports. All these files. Now you can you can store the result in some variable also. Let me store the result in DF. So DF I am giving DF because DF means uh, data frame. Let us say. Yeah. Some some portion. Hello. Continue, sir. Please continue. Yeah, okay. Okay. Some noise is coming. Okay. Now you see, I have stored the result in DF. Now, if you wanted to see the first ten lines like that, there are it supports some commands called DF dot head. Head will give you first uh, five rows, first five rows inside DF. You see, these are the first five rows. You can specify if you want ten rows, give ten, like this. Okay. Similarly, if you want last ten rows, you give tail command. Instead of head, you give tail. 
it will give you last 10 rows if you want information about this uh, data set you call df.info you see what is there in df.info so df.info you see what it is telling it is a data frame there are 87 entries ranging from 0 to 86 there are five columns total what is the first column name full name second column is institute name and address third column is designation and so on it was giving information about each and everything so what it is telling it is telling that are there any null null entities null uh, values inside the data it is giving so here there is no null data now let me show let me uh, go to csv file my csv file this dirty data csv file and let me show you okay this dirty data let me again run it and let me show you df.info here so i am running it again dirty data dot csv i am storing it in df okay now what is df.info let me run df.info what it is telling df.info it is telling that you see out of 32 entries in the first column there are no null entries but in the day, second column there is one null entry so it was telling 31 non null that means what one entry is null similarly here you see there are two null values so what are those null values if you go and see here you see can, can you see this nan number that is not defined okay these are nas nan means undefined values here you see one more nan is there here so it is giving that information also if there are some null values it is giving that information also in df.info sorry to so, disturb you can you please relate this with a neural network concept sir i will do it suppose i have a wind energy data yeah okay i wanted to take how much wind is blowing uh, yeah. in a particular period of time how will yeah. i do it with the neural network mapping so neural for neural network mapping mapping you have to use uh, that layers and so on the, the, is it covered or not in a uh, network structure uh, they, they need to he has to start the probability only he has finished okay then maybe there he will demonstrate it madam uh, if, okay. uh, if, if i show you now maybe it is difficult okay yeah. because then only it is possible for us to correlate the things right yeah yes madam uh, it will be covered in uh, there okay in uh, artificial neural networks Fine, so fine. yeah, here I'm uh, describing all these things because you can uh, upload data sets. Then you can see what is the data inside each column. If you have some null data, you can drop the, those null values. Now I'll tell you, suppose here it was telling that there is a null value. Now suppose if you want to uh, uh, drop those null values. So before going to null, dropping null values, there is some other command calls df dot is null. So what it will tell, it is analogous to this df.info. Now you see what it is telling. It is giving false, false, false means that uh, that value is not a null value. So if it is true means that value is null. Let me sh show you where the true came. Somewhere, yeah, you see here, true means the value is null value. Okay. Now, suppose if you want to drop all the rows uh, where the null values are there, Suppose if you want to drop, how, how to drop those things? You can simply call df dot drop drop any drop null values. Wherever null values are there, they will be dropped. So if you see earlier, how many rows are there? Zero to 32. 31. 31. 31 means 32 rows are there. Now you see, now let me see after dropping, how many are there? Zero to same 31 0 to 31 yeah yeah now yeah let me tell you how many columns are there 1 2 3 4 5 6 columns 1 2 3 4 5 5 5 columns are five there 5 columns okay here also yeah this is data 5 columns Five columns are there. It is not dropping. It seems. Let me see. Drop null values. It should drop. 
okay let me give this column wise or axis let me give axis so there is this option called axis using axis you can specify whether you want to draw columns or rows let me give columns now you see wherever uh, null values are there that column was dropped now you see now if you see there are only three three columns three columns see, yeah in other uh, columns, null values are there, so those uh, columns were dropped. Similarly, you can write x is equals to rows here, x is equals to rows. Then what it will do, it will drop the rows where the null value. values are there. Yeah, same. Let me give columns only here. So now, yeah, it may not be appropriate to drop all the columns. Suppose there are 32 columns are there, 32 rows were there. Uh, out of 32 records, there is only one null value somewhere. Just because of this one null value, you wanted to drop entire column. It may not be appropriate, right? So if you wanted to fill the data, fill that null value with some data, you can fill also that way. So let me fill that one. So how to fill that one? There is a command called fill and a. Okay, using this fill and a, you can fill. So let me give pf dot. Fill NA. So I wanted to fill the null value with 100. You can fill the null value. With 100. Now you see what will happen. If you see the result, let me come down. You see, see here it is a date, but still, still it is a null value and I am filling with 100. But is it, uh, is it good to fill the date with 100? It is also not good. If you want to fill column wise, how to do column wise? You first give a column name, df dot date. Let me access, let me access the column date using df dot date. And then fill null value with some uh, date format. Let me give current date. What is the current date? 7, 20, 7, 20, and 2021. If I give this way, now you see that null value was filled with, where is the null value? I think uh, this one, it was filled with the current date, 720, 2021. Okay, okay, this is the date, so we are giving uh, the current value, but for other columns, let us say these columns are there, numbers are there. Now instead of uh, randomly filling with some value, uh, if you want to calculate average and if you want to fill, you can do that one also. How to do that one? First find mean, then fill the null value with mean. So how to fill, uh, how to calculate mean? First of all, suppose if you want to calculate duration, okay, and mean. This is the mean of uh, mean duration, right? Let me store it in mean. <laughs> Now what I do? DF, 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 duration, duration, dot, fill null values, with what? I am filling with mean value. This way you can do. 68 point something, it, it will come, yeah, where, where it is. Okay, there are no null values in this DF dot duration. Uh, let me change it to something else. So this way, okay, so here yeah, there are no null values, but if there are null values, it will fill the null values with main value. Is it okay? Is it okay? Filling null values and removing null values and so on. Now let me tell you how to remove duplicate rows. If suppose there are duplicate rows, can we remove those duplicate rows? Yes. So first let me check whether duplicates are there or not. So there is a function called df dot duplicated. Now let me see whether it is duplicated or not, whether there are any duplicate rows. There are, yeah, one more, one, one place, you see, true, that means what? It is a duplicated row. So now we have found a duplicated row. Now if you want to duplicate, if you want to remove these duplicates, then df dot, Drop, yeah, drop duplicates. 
run this command dm dot drop duplicates. Now earlier 31 rows were there. Now we'll see. Where is this one? Yeah, it is there, but uh, index will be missing. Yeah, 12. Now you see the 12 was gone. Index 12. That means what? Earlier we have found that 12, 12th row is duplicated, so it was removed. So this way you can remove duplicate also. So we can do all this kind of uh, processing, pre processing uh, using uh, these pandas. You read a data set and then you do all this pre processing, eliminate null values, fill the missing values. So it is called fill, uh, handling missing values. If you have missing data, you, you can fill the missing values with some uh, some main value or some random value. You can give whatever you want. Similarly, if you have duplicate rows, you can remove the duplicate rows and all these things. It is like pre processing. We can do all this pre processing. Any questions? Any questions? So Yeah, please uh, mute yourself, madam, Mr. Madam, because some echo is coming to other participants. I think uh, she, she muted. Okay, now, if, if you have any questions in Pandas, I will answer. Otherwise, I will take 10-15 uh, minutes and I will tell you how to generate plots. Because I don't have much time. I have only one hour to cover. Yeah, please. Vivek. Sir, if we have removed any row, then the indexing which has been done is not uh, consistent. That if it, we are we have missed the row 12th after 11th, we are at 13. Yeah, so yeah. if we want to index it uh, from uh, starting again, then how can we do that? Okay, how, how we want to consistency? Okay, so I have of this df dot drop duplicates. I'm thinking it will support some. Uh, you see, keep boolean first in place. Ignore index. Ignore index. Maybe. Optional union. So here maybe this options. One of the options. Uh, it will give it will give that uh, that kind of functionality. Okay, sir. I will explore that. Yeah, yeah. Please. You see here, ignore index. By default, false, false. If you give true, then the resulting axis will be labeled as zero, one, two, and so on. I hope this one will work. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Because it is difficult to remember all the options. Okay, now let me go to this uh, visualization. So, Python, in Python, you can generate plots using many libraries. One of the libraries is matplotlib. The name matplotlib was uh, used because it generates MATLAB style of MATLAB style of plots. So we'll see how to generate uh, plots using matplotlib. So how first we'll see how to import this matplotlib. Import matplotlib dot pyplot as plot. Okay, this one. So matplotlib is the library. This is the submodule. Pyplot is the submodule inside matplotlib. And uh, the shortcut name I'm using is plt. So instead of writing matplotlib dot pyplot, I will simply use plt plot. Now. First, let me tell you the basic way to generate, then let me tell you the direct way to generate. So if you want to generate some plot, suppose first let me generate some data. So just now we have seen this NumPy. So we know uh, how to generate data using uh, NumPy. So I am generating uh, using this lint space. Just now we have seen np.lint space, 0 to 10. I am generating 100 points, let us say. Let me say 0 to 1, you can say 0 to 1. 100 points. Why? Attribute error. Module NumPy has no attribute. Lint space. Okay, this spelling mistake. Lint space. Okay, I have generated X. Okay, now if you want to see X, you can see. 
Okay, now suppose you want to plot x versus sin x. How to do in uh, using this matplotlib? So first, this plt dot figure. This is the basic command figure. So what it will do? It will initialize the. It will initialize a figure. You see what what will happen? You see it has initialized a figure with this much dimension, four thirty two and two eighty eight with no axis. So now we can add axis using a command called plot.axis. We can store it in AX. AX. Now let me show you the result after this. Now you see the second command will add axis, x axis and y axis. What is what the first command will do? It will initialize the figure. It will uh, initialize some space for the figure. Let us say the uh, figure is of some dimension. It will initialize that much space for the figure. This command will initialize axis also. Now, if you want to plot something, you call this function plt.plot. You pass x and y. And you see what will happen. Yeah, why, why, why is not defined? Let me why means what I wanted to instead of y, I wanted to calculate sin x, x versus sin x. Sin is not defined because sin is defined in np, numpy. So let me give np dot sin x. np dot sin x. It is not actual sign one. Why it was p dot sign? Let me remove these two things. Actually, for plot function, it, these are not required. I'm directly telling you this way. np plot dot plot zero to one. Hundred evenly. Hundred samples have generated zero to one, and I'm applying sign x. Wait. Okay, but it was uh, it was not actually sine x. Yeah, zero to one. Yeah, true. This is true. Sine x. Okay, right. Yeah, zero to one. It will increase. Yeah. So this is sine x. Let me generate some points between zero to ten and fifty points. Now let us see how it will look like. Can you see? This is like sine curve, actual sine curve between zero to ten. Using this plot dot plot function. So this is direct command, plot dot plot. So the other way is uh, I have told you right, uh, plot dot figure, plot dot axis, then ax dot figure, then ax dot plot. You can call ax dot figure. Yeah. So let me post this one. So this is line graph. If you want to generate some scatter plot, you can generate scatter plot also. What is scatter plot? Scatter plot means see what is scatter plot. Scatter plot means it will simply project the points. It will simply project the points. This is scatter plot. Is it okay? If you are already comfortable with Python, then uh, We will simply run these commands. These are very basic commands. So, how to change this? Uh, like, uh, it is uh, you can change the font size uh, diagram based on all that. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, the, yeah you can apply all kind of customizations. Uh -huh. If you want to give us a let us say you want to change color. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is an option called color. You mm -hmm. give red. Let me give red. And the font like like uh, Times New Roman font size 10, 12, like that. Is it possible? This this size. 
no the axis size axis uh, font size i'm telling axis font size uh, uh, yeah it supports you have to explore those options inside this plot you see this is what i was telling earlier also this plot dot plot there are many options i have not even explored that one that uh, times new roman all these things we have to see what are the options that this plot supports it was not coming here it will show all the options that were supported by plot command let, let me run this plot dot okay not here here uh, plot dot plot yeah format in this format this option using this option you can change all those things formatting like color marker style line style shortcut string notion described okay all these things you can change here but if you want uh, times new raman i am not sure because i have not used this one how to read uh, any syntax using this uh, python like syntax in the matlab means... matlab yeah. matlab if i type help uh, function it will give me right how to yeah, use okay, okay 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 so like that yeah, how yeah. it can yeah. yeah yeah suppose you have some yesterday i have discussed right di directory one command is dir the other command is uh, that question mark which will, which will give you help okay right yesterday itself i have shown you those things yeah suppose here x is there x is there now let me run it first now let me go x and the question mark it will give you help see help this is since since it is a m a numpy array it was telling that it is a numpy array and uh, what are the functions that you can this is length is 50 like this it was showing all the things that can be performed on this it was showing this is the help if you apply dir then it will show you what are the functions that can be performed on this let me give a small x You see, these are the functions that can be performed on this NumPy array. You see, transpose you can perform, to list, you can convert to list, reshape, repeat. There are many functions. I have skipped many things because it's difficult to cover all these things. Simply using DIR command, it will tell you all the operations that can be performed on this one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think you are. Uh... System runs out of battery. We need to recharge yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, so we have seen this two curves, line style, line, line chart, and uh, scatter plot similarly you can generate many other plots like if you want to generate histograms histograms you can generate so for the same x for the same x if you want to generate histogram basically you know what histogram will do histogram will give you the frequency frequencies right how many points are there between in each bin so how to generate histogram plot dot there is a command called plot dot hist you simply pass x and then uh, there are many options that uh, this uh, histogram supports. What are the options? Number of bins you can specify. Let us say the number of bins are 10. Let me say. Now see what is the output. Output is like a single bar. You are saying you are generating 10 bins, but here there is only one bin. Because what is this lean? Lean space will give you. Lean space will give you linearly separated elements, linearly, linearly spaced elements, right? So, when you are creating 10 bins means what, 0 to 1, 1 bin, 0 to 1, 1 bin. How many elements are there between 0 to 1? 5 elements are there. 1 to 2, 1 bin. How many elements are there between 1, 2 to 5 elements and so on. So, that's why it is giving all equal. So, here, but there is no separation between bins. How to separate those bins? There is an option called row width. 
let me give row width equals to 0.9. Let me see what will happen. Row width. Oh, bins, I have not specified. Let me give 10 bins. Row width. Now you see there is a clear separation between these bins and frequency of each bin is same because the data we have generated is bin space. Now instead of that one, let me generate some random data and then let me create histogram. np.rand and rand integers between 0 and uh, 500, 0 and uh, 10,000, let us say, 0 and 10,000. Let me generate 500 integers. Okay, now, now let me count these things. Plot dot histogram of x and then I want 10 bits into 10 bits. You see, this is the output. Okay, now let me give row width. Then it will look good. Row width. Row width is 0.9. Let me give. Can you see this one? This histogram. Now it was clearly indicating the frequency of each and every bin. 0 to, let us say, this is 1000. 0 to 1000, how many? 1000 to 2000, how many? 2000 to 3000, how many? And like this. These are random. That's why we can clearly see the difference of each uh, bin. Any other questions? There are many things that can be that can be done with Matplotlib, but I am not covering all those things. Any questions? One question. Uh, hello. Yeah, please. Yes, sir. Uh, if we obtain a CSV file or an Excel file for uh, of data of more than two or three years of something, for example, yeah. wind energy yeah. data yeah. or pollutant yeah. data, yeah. then uh, they, before doing operations on it, like pred for prediction, neural network or anything, yeah. we need to refine the data. So yes. what is yeah. the algorithm like? What are the steps we need to do in refining the data? Uh, for example, uh, removing the null values or refilling the data. What is the of a concept uh, like what we, what all steps you need to do for algorithm yeah okay so this missing values you have to identify first missing if there are any missing values then fill those missing values then similarly you have to find first you have to find duplicate any duplicate rows are there or not if there are any duplicate records simply remove those duplicate records then identify missing values fill those missing values then identify are there any are there any outliers okay if there are some outliers, you please try to remove those outliers. This kind of pre-processing steps we apply on the data. Yeah. Normally, normally we call that as a feature extraction. Whatever yeah. the data you wanted to extract, you should specify, and then you should take that data alone. So yeah. you have different feature extraction techniques. Yeah, feature data extraction will be covered uh, later on. This is only yeah. pre-processing. He was asking about only pre-processing data. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if we upload, okay, if we convert, if we change CSV file which is loaded into data frame, will it change original file also? No, no. No. We are, uh, what? We are loading the data into data frame, that's all. Into a variable, DF is, you see, I was storing in DF. DF is like a variable, that's all. Okay, okay. Oh, will it change the original file also? Okay. Okay, any other questions? So today when you upload uh, this uh, IPYNB file on Google Drive and we download it, uh, yeah. we won't be having the same CSV file and Excel file as you have uploaded. Then how do we... Okay, then I will, I will upload those things also. This dirty data file I will upload because the, some duplicates were there and some null values were there. Yes, I will upload those things also. You said you will share some materials with us for the Python learning. Will you be in a question to do it? Okay, I will give links then. 
directly yeah, or, or you want directly text yeah okay yeah. even the links will be good fine for us okay okay, okay. because i am new to python i okay. wanted to learn that's why i registered for this class yeah yeah workshops yeah yeah, yeah. thank you thank you madam we will share any other questions Okay, if no no other questions, then I will uh, conclude for today. Thank you all. Let me stop recording.